A great storyboard artist isn't necessarily Michelangelo, isn't necessarily a fabulous animator. What a great storyboard artist is, is a great communicator. Hi, this is a storyboard drawing, one of the essential tools in the making of an animated film. Storyboards allow the filmmakers to see a blueprint of the movie before we go into actual animation production. Walt Disney developed the use of storyboards way back in the 1920s for his classic Mickey Mouse cartoon, Steamboat Willie. Storyboards are like little comic book panels of the entire movie, and they're used by tacking them up on a bulletin board so you can actually see the continuity of the movie. You can see the rough staging and camera positions. You can see the acting of the characters. The dialogue is written underneath. In animation, storyboarding has always been and is still used mainly to develop the story. Now, in our studio, we don't write our stories. We draw them. Storyboards being an effective and very inexpensive way of developing the content for the movie gave Disney the opportunity to board up something and see if it worked before expensive animation took place. You start off and you start visualizing it like a, like a comic strip kind of. You, you work out the business and you, you develop it that way. And then you look at it and you go, is this working? Is this funny? Is this dramatic? What can we change? So this is why we work like this because these things can be changed so quickly, you know? They're on, they're off. And you can move things around and uh, see how things play. A great storyboard artist can put down on a storyboard the minimum amount of information necessary to get a very dynamic and quick read on the content and the emotions in the sequence. When you're actually drawing the story sketches, you get emotional about them yourself, and so you're looking for things that have a lot of heart, and you are trying to draw that in a very simple way to express what you're feeling. That's great story sketching. Hitchcock said, storyboard artist has to be a good storyteller. It isn't enough to just make a beautiful drawing. The drawing has to have the meaning and the feelings of what you were trying to say. Usually if you have a good storyboard artist, he's also a good pitch artist as well. When you're pitching a board, you do all the parts and everything. You take on the characters, you change your voice, and you'd even add effects, you know. You'd take on a woman's voice, the old man's voice, or whatever it was. And it was very harrowing when you'd bring Walt into the room because he could pitch better than anybody. Once he got rolling, he would get excited, he would, he would act it out, and you sat there mesmerized by Walt's storytelling. That was Walt's great ability. <laughs> a storyboard pitch is one of the great performance arts that was developed in this century at Disney's and um, no one ever gets to see it. The next step after you've shown your board, it's been okayed, everybody loves it, let's put it on a story reel. Those storyboards are taken and shot on film and timed to a rough soundtrack. So you can actually see the movie playing in real time before any animation takes place. Walt Disney invented the idea of making these story reels, telling the story in a simple form before you went to the more complex form. It was, at the time, I think, incredibly innovative, as most of what Walt Disney had done. Often storyboard artists are noted for putting in business, putting in interesting things for the characters to do. Every artist usually winds up having something that they really excel at, you know, whether it be the emotional end of it or whether they uh, are for the chases. Willie Reitherman, he was the expert on chases. You definitely cast storyboard artists according to what their strengths are. Some storyboard artists are really comic artists and they will concentrate on the humor. Other artists are much more cinematic and you would use them for action scenes. Walt was very smart. He cast the story people who he thought were going to be the best ones on that particular sequence. Soon, a lot of Hollywood was noticing how good Walt Disney's movies were, and the use of storyboards was a large part of that. Over the years, this process was adopted by Disney's live-action directors. And now, storyboards are used on almost every live-action production around the world. There are so many people involved in the motion picture making process that everybody has to be aware of the central needs of the film. 
And that's where the storyboard can let everybody in on the secrets. If I can make things work on paper, then I can make them work on the set. And if I can create a visual style on paper, I can absolutely create it on God's green earth. I worked with Jeffrey Katzenberg on the Shrek movies, who had really read everything that Walt Disney had ever written about filmmaking. So I was very lucky to learn Walt Disney's technique of using the storyboards as a writing storytelling tool. In The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, I storyboarded the whole film so I could actually watch the movie before I started shooting it. In order to convince people to give me the time to storyboard the whole movie ahead of time, I said, look, this is an expensive writing tool, but a really inexpensive production tool. The storyboard indicates what you will see on the screen and also indicate what you don't need to spend money on. The storyboard can cut out a lot of unnecessary work. My attachment to storyboards is I, I act and direct. And I like to kind of be able to take the pressure off myself by anticipating how I'm going to shoot something. And then I can sense new opportunities on the set that could not have been necessarily anticipated in a room where I was drawing with an artist. When a storyboard artist works with a director on a film, it's kind of like he's been given a portion of the pie. What the storyboard artist gets to do is add a lot of his own touches to the material. Storyboards are a great way to keep everyone on the page and creatively it's a great way to start creating and visualizing uh, the movie itself. All right, well, let's turn this thing around. I had a lot of fun with Mick Reinman coming up with ways to visualize this story and we would sit around in my barn and we would come up with different things. Hey, what about this ladybug? We'll have the power hitter, Ted Ray's getting ready to just hit this massive drive. And what if a ladybug drops down the ball and it becomes like a drama about the ladybug? And so we had a lot of fun laying all that out. My first day on the film Saboteur, it was my first real contact with Hitchcock. I was on one side of the desk, he was on the other. And uh, he would make his little drawings and then I would make some on the same sequence. I think Hitchcock was really testing me. What I try to do is start off with the scenes where I really maybe want to establish my film language. Maybe on the first scene, take them through step by step. Like I want a big horizon shot and then I want, you know, a wagon coming from right to left. But then I'll let them do all the scenes after that by themselves because I would rather have the benefit in this collaborative atmosphere to have him think of an idea that I never would have thought of. Well, I started with a script, and in the script I would make very rough drawings. Then I would go to Hitchcock, and we would discuss the various sequences and see if my thoughts were anything near like his. In live action, the use of storyboarding really kind of evolved into a tool for staging, so they know where they have to set the cameras, what the special effects might be. If there were difficult passages, take a film like The Birds, in which we had to get these little flying creatures into almost every shot, we needed to storyboard of practically the whole film. And also in a, in a very complex film like Saboteur. Saboteur needed a lot of drawing so that everybody knew what we, our problems were. Quite often when we're about to shoot a scene, we'll actually start by pinning up all the storyboards. It's often a useful tool to communicate to your art directors, the set designers, you know, sometimes the actors, kind of this is what the scene is doing, and really block out the scene using the storyboards as a point of reference the notion that a picture's worth a thousand words, it really comes into play when you're dealing with storyboards because I can really get eight people behind me and I can point and everybody can suddenly be on the same page. With a lot of big sequences in live action, with battles and so on, you'll have three or four units shooting at once. So those storyboards become a tool to communicate to them. You give them to your second unit director saying, I need this shot, this shot, this shot. <laughs> Open range, for instance, there's the final shootout sequence, which was about 12 days on a schedule. 
And nine out of those 12 days, I had to go to cover sets because we were experiencing weather changes. We needed the light that we started the sequence in to be the light that we ended it in. So the storyboard saved me. When we actually were gonna come back to that sequence, which was very elaborate, everybody knew what we were gonna be coming back to. There was gonna be no guesswork. And so I find them uh, my greatest tool, actually, the storyboard. Live action directors use storyboards for a variety of purposes in the filmmaking process. But in animation, storyboards have always been and are still used to develop the story and the characters. Walt Disney was a great story developer and a great story editor. If he saw a sequence on boards that he didn't think was working, it would come out of the movie and a new one would be developed. So you throw the whole thing out and you start from scratch and you'd get all excited again and start building it up. I think a great storyboard artist has that ability to get excited <laughs> after it's been shot down and move on and build the excitement over again. The amount of time spent on developing a Disney film was often decades. There are early versions in the 1930s of storyboards for Alice in Wonderland, storyboards for Peter Pan, even though those movies didn't come out until the 1950s. For Lady and the Tramp, Joe Grant actually pitched the idea to Walt in 1937. An active storyboard development didn't take place until 43. The movie itself came out in 55. So you can see almost a 20-year period there of developing what actually got into Lady and the Tramp. If we boarded a version and it wasn't quite working, Walt would say, well, let's not follow this version, let's start another version. Every drawing you got thrown out. It didn't matter because out of the whole thing, what they were suggesting was it going to be better. We would have the storyboard shot with the still camera and we'd make an eight by 10 negative. So every storyboard was recorded and then the individual sketches would be taken off the storyboard and then they'd be filed away. Walt Disney in the purest sense was an artist, but he also had that idiosyncrasy of an artist who just throws his great work away because in some way it doesn't match up. But listen, every cartoon is still measured against Walt Disney. He knew the difference. And I would trust him, I just, I would trust him. And we do trust him, we trust him with our children. A storyboard is the, is the first look at the film. You know, where you, you can actually f go down the board and see the film. So it's, it's by definition, it's, it's what is about to go onto celluloid. I found that I uh, get great enjoyment out of just sitting in a car and staring at the landscape if I'm being driven. Um, and whether I'm going through an industrial area or a obviously beautiful area, um, I'm always fascinated by what I boil down to really the performance of light on objects. And even industrial is beautiful, right? So. I started to see that early on when I was a um, kid because I've always painted and drawn more than usual. My most informative years were art school, post grammar school. Um, I didn't uh, really enjoy school. And uh, I basically woke up when I went to art school and uh, spent seven years at art school, which is fairly standard if you're heading towards the teaching profession, um, four years provincial and then three years at somewhere higher level, which was the, happened to be the Royal College of Art. Um, so, yeah, it's pretty, I'm pretty highly trained in that area, and therefore have always been able to lend, lend my hand to, and be able to talk about with pretty well every department, which deals with anything that would come under the heading of art, or art, like costume, like uh, set design, obviously. And the storyboard starts off in my mind as I'm actually reading the script. And I can literally get flashes on the location of, which will very often actually 
give me a reason to choose that particular location because I start to see the scene in the room or on the location or wherever it is. And I can literally get images bing bing in the head. And then that gets put down. I start to thumbnail scribble things thinking that, yeah, this will work, this is, this is fine. You know, thumbnails are awfully fast if you know what you're doing. And I'm a draftsman, so I can really thumbnail something down as the state of play for the day, it, it literally as I'm going there in the morning in a car. Um, and it's a, like a refresher course in what you're about to do. And everybody finds their own way, I think, whether you're an actor or whether you're a director. You find your own way going there that morning. Um, so when you hit the set, you know exactly what you, you've got a target. And uh, sometimes I don't leave it that late. Sometimes it's it's done way earlier. And if in which case is I just glance through the boards, and I may have some new thoughts that morning as I'm going in. In which case then there'll be notations to the board or thumbnails on the board to remind me that this may be better or that may be better. You know, it's like a rehearsal for me. So I think that's why very often when I hit the set, I know exactly what I want to do because I've talked through it with the storyboard artist. In fact, it's almost like the talking through with a storyboard artist that has almost prepared me totally to, because uh, you have to articulate exactly what you're going to do. And uh, so when I hit the floor to do a scene, or whether it's, you know, whatever it is, um, I usually, uh, you know, ask the actors if they don't mind, but should I just suggest what we're going to do and um, uh, rarely do they say, well, you know, why are we doing it that way? So it seems to work out. It seems to get distilled in that discussion. So they all seem to be perfectly happy about saying, sounds like a good plan, let's do it, you know. This is nothing new what I, that I'm practicing. Um, uh, it goes back to the great, you know, filmmakers of the th 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, I think Hitchcock was the one who was the main, uh, was a very pu much publicized um, you know, user of a storyboard and he would stick to the storyboard, uh, which doesn't mean that he couldn't vie away from it if he saw something more interesting on the day. Doing a, a board which starts from a thumbnail to a polished board, I think is a bit like being a writer. They will start, you know, in the left hand corner of the canvas or page and work right through. They'll do a pass and just, and the, the key on painting is to actually, uh, what I always found for me, get rid of the white, get rid of the white canvas. Um, get something ac right across the canvas. Um, otherwise, if you don't, you're always looking at that area of white, which is like a blank sheet. And so a writer, I think writers very often like to bash through the script. That's why they don't like to hand in pages because they like to rework. And as Steve, the, I've worked with him twice now, he has phrases, I like to come back and massage the page or massage the script in areas because very often he'll bash down a scene because he doesn't want to spend time on it. I think is the way he works, gets it down, knowing it has to be there, but I'll come back and make it better because the screenplay is organic, right? So something may occur here, but then occur there. So you want to come back later and deal with that and change it or make it better. Same with storyboards, you start off with thumbnails and then if I'm getting really interested in the scene, think, oh, I've just seen, when I draw, I get sucked into the scene. So when I'm sucked into the scene, I start to visualize other opportunities, which aren't just um, pictures, there may be suggestions for actors, the way the scene can go, how you can adjust and maybe even finally how the words are used, you know. Um, so I, when I do that, I it's abstract because in fact it's wasting time because I'm sitting there and I'll start to really finish a frame and then uh, and I'll sometimes just finish a frame so it's really really drawn shaded dark light get me anatomy right um, and then I'll move on with thumbnails but in a funny kind of way it's like a thumbprint for the storyboard artist to go oh, okay that's what it's like and then to work with that you don't draw every frame in every cut. Or if something gets tricky, I will virtually draw every frame in every cut. Um, and you find a way of thumbnailing, adding with big frames and small frames. So, in fact, a storyboard becomes rather like a sophisticated comic strip. Well, in fact, now comic strips are very sophisticated. And um, ideally, that's what a storyboard should be. 
because you're seeing the dynamics of, you know, and if it's really well drawn, then you can follow the dynamics of the sequence. And um, even if it's dialogue, you can always do something with a dialogue scene that isn't just two talking heads, but then, uh, of course, two talking heads can also be interesting, you know. So it's knowing where to pull back. Other people now go to great lengths of actually doing electronic storyboards where I can plan walking into this house, walk into this room, circle the room, and the camera, the story, the, this, the electronic process will allow someone to see exactly what you'll see in that room. I don't need that. I don't like that. But people do and plan it that way. You can either get it in cage form on the computer, or you can go further and fill it in and color the walls and put in the furniture. You literally go the whole hog if you want. But I don't need to do that. Fortunately, it takes too long. I think amusingly, I've always been accused of being over-designed and over-thought out in, in, with the visual aspects of uh, the films I do. And I used to take that on board initially because I, I, I got rather depressed about the fact that Julius was classified as too beautiful. And, uh, and Alien was a bit light on characterization and all on dynamics. And Blade Runner was criticized, be, I think, uh, as, as to having a simplistic story albeit a very depressing story um, set against this ever reigning, ever, you know, ever growing darkness, right? And um, now I think I'll just stay with the plan. <laughs> you have sold a shit ton of movies. How do you pitch a movie? What do, you, what do you mean by pitch? I what? mean, like, how do you sell a movie? What? In the room. In a room. How in do you sell room. a movie in a room? Okay, um... Something he just you've I've, done it a lot, so just think about what you did. I've done it five or six times. Uh, I've done pitching, selling pitches five or six or seven times, but uh, selling specs is harder. Selling a spec is, of course, when you've written a script on your own and you uh, take it out, and that's the way to bank the big money. Getting an assignment is when you when they had an idea, like getting a James Bond movie would be an assignment, right. getting an X Men movie would be an assignment. You compete against other writers with pitches to get that assignment. Not a good way to make big money. I, I've I've still actually never done an assignment, um, but I, I've wanted them. And you know, you, you, pitch for, you, you pitch think them. you think I don't want to write Daredevil? You're insane. So like, like your Peter, so like like the Peter Pan, like the Peter Pan. The Peter Pan thing would be a pitch. Okay. The thing I did earlier would be a pitch, except for the way I told it to you guys. I, I sort of, well, when you get into it, pitching is sort of three things. There there are different ways to do it, and you have to tailor them to the room you're in. And the way you tailor it to the room you're in is you see how interested the person is, if the person seems like they're with it. You have to have really good listening and empathy skills, which I don't generally have outside of these rooms. But in the rooms, I'm pretty good at it. You have to be able to take the temperature visually and socially of the person you're talking to. Because if they are excited about you and excited to meet you and want to hear it, you can go fucking nuts. You can talk for 30 minutes. But if they just are hearing it because they heard it was a good idea from some junior exec, you need to keep it to like 10 to 15 minutes. So when you talk about pitching, you're really talking about three different styles of thing. The first thing to do, uh, the first one, and the one that I'd say do the least, uh, is actually pitching a movie beat by beat. It's going from your outline and telling scene by scene what happens from beginning to end of a movie. That is boring to listen to. Unless you're like a really good storyteller, if you're detailing every twist and every nook and cranny of the movie, you're setting yourself up to fail because the moment you allow the person to become bored or disengage, and that's what I'm talking about with the, the social thing, is that you have to know when someone's slowly disengaging from you. You can't afford to be up your own ass. You have to really watch them. Uh, it, the moment that happens, you lose the pitch. You came in and you, you talk for 20 minutes. You set every scene. It's a mess. Okay, the way I generally do it, uh, like what I did with Peter Pan, is, is more of a beat-by-beat beat thing. You don't actually say the whole movie, but you describe the movie as though you already saw it. So you want to sell your oh, friends. that's interesting. You, you want to sell your friends on coming and seeing this movie with you, right? So imagine you went and saw Reservoir Dogs. Okay. You wouldn't tell them the end and the whole story of Reservoir Dogs, but you'd pitch the shit out of that first act, right? You'd right. explain everything. And as long as you don't, you know, you don't get into dialogue, you don't get into what the characters say, you talk about the movie like you've seen it. Like, oh, there's this great scene where then this happens. And you keep the things in order. You're still pitching the plot, but you're doing it loose, and loose is good. 
loose is good always because it allows people who are listening because keep in mind these people are creative people they're called creative executives they consider themselves creative whether or not they're creative is hit or miss but they do love story and they do know story and if you give them opportunities to they'll fill in the blanks oh they'll for pitch you. stuff to you oh and then it could be this yeah and then it could be this careful of that that's the hard one because that sort of happens in the third one but the the thing is is you don't want them to say anything to you during it but if you skipped an element of the plot and they go and you like let's say a character betrays another character and you didn't you don't really explain why in the motivations you just say it but you've mentioned the reasons for it earlier let them be like oh because earlier this happened and you go exactly and they go i get this story you know you, you sort of you let them spell out the details so what's the third way the third way is the hardest way and you can only do it with big ideas um and it, it, it's insanely hard the is third that only when an executive goes, so what's the big idea? And that's when you can do it that <laughs> Coming way. Coming to my house at midnight. That's when you can do it the third way. If the executive says, so what's the big idea? You're fine. You're like, <laughs> like, you're in the 30s. You need yeah. to, because because all of these elements exist within each other. You should have them all at your fingertips. Like, don't get me wrong. This is this is a unique thing to me that I think is really good. And I've, I've been told a lot of other writers don't have, but it's something I'm proud of, is when I talk about a movie, I can do any of these. I know that movie really fucking well and the parts i don't know i'll make up on the spot and i'll be ready to make them up so you just have to know you just have to know exactly what you, you have, have to know to, the whole universe you have to know the whole universe you need to know what's happening from scene to scene because if you seem like you don't know what you're talking about you're not going to sell it the way to do it is the second way the way you heard me where i really pitched the first act and then i know the details of what the second and third act are and it's like we can talk about them but you know i don't want to take up too much of your time because so, you don't want it what was the third way what was the hard way the hardest way and also the easiest way, if you have the idea, is by just talking about an idea. Talking about the central, cool idea of something. If you can do that, and that's generally has, has a lot to do with the big idea and also your own sort of, like I've only done it once, um, your own sort of power within the industry. An example, Inception. They're robbers who steal ideas in dreams. If Inception hadn't come out yet, and even not a Christopher Nolan level guy had said that to an executive. It's like, well, I've never fucking seen that before. The question of what the plot is, maybe you can skirt it a little bit. I mean, the movie Inception certainly did. Yeah. You know, you just sort so of, oh, log. wait, here comes the kick, you guys. Yeah, yeah no. <laughs> dun, 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 dun. So it's the log line, pretty it's much. The, it's the log line, but it has to be a compelling log line, and you need to be able to back it up with a few scenes. If you can sell a movie like that, good on you. Because that generally means they trust you. And selling a pitch and selling a script and getting an assignment all of it is about trust it's about trust in an individual you stack a paper an unsolicited script means nothing you have to build a reputation in generals as being kind of a cool guy you get to be an asshole later at least i see people being an asshole i i haven't gotten to the point where i'm cocky about my shit in meetings only outside <laughs> <laughs> only outside. only getting in the bar i tweet you know i tweet like hashtag greatest screenwriter alive just i don't mention that in the meetings in the meetings i'm you know oh sir oh yes your idea is very good <laughs> you know Christ. like uh that was uh, an impression of an american indian man <laughs> no i uh it, it's it's funny because all of these different things rely on two things how much they trust you and how much you trust yourself because as long as you're never lost for words in a pitch you did good okay marker it's an art unto itself everybody pitches differently to distill your idea down to just a minute in 60 seconds or less now obviously the first piece of advice is to be concise <laughs> be very clear about what your story is you can't just flail around oh and this happens and this happens and this guy does this interest and intrigue people and talk about character if it can be two sentences and i can have an understanding of your plot and your tone if you can't say it concisely then i don't think you really know what film you're trying to make pitch the the way you would to your friend you know speak from the heart you've got to keep the energy going and have a lot of personality which hopefully you can buy somewhere fake <laughs> you have to connect with your audience you're like i'm smiling you should be smiling most of all i think fashion you have to believe in your ideas to make them visualize something fantastic it's all kind of 
crazy and difficult, but ultimately like fun and thrilling and delicious. Not everything has to fit into 60 seconds, but for the purpose of pitching, it does. And that's just how it goes. Uh, good luck. <laughs>